People need comedy right now. They need it. All right. So, so, then that would be it. Okay. Right? Well, well, let's define social. Let me tell you what really drives me nuts. <laughs> Chelsea Handler. Oh, no. I'm a total Were you funny as a kid? I don't know. Some people would argue that I'm still not funny. On race? Wake up and get out of your own and to actually look around the world at people that don't look like you. White privilege. White people have to step up every single time they see an infraction or an injustice. And finding love. Something about you always felt to me like someone who would enjoy a family. Am I projecting? Carla, are you hitting on me right now? <laughs> I peed in my pants from laughing while we were filming, I think, twice during that show. So that was a good time. Chelsea Handler, welcome to the show. Thank you, thank you. Welcome to your show too. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad to be on my show, and I'm glad to be on my show with you. Where, uh, where are we finding you? Where are you today? I'm in Vietnam. No, I'm, I'm in Los Angeles. <laughs> I'm in my house right now. Just, I'm just sitting here, get real pretty up, getting ready to do your show. What, what have you done differently during this COVID time? I know you obviously have launched a variety of things from your new film to your book to what have you, but what, what have you done differently? Has COVID changed you literally as a human being well, in any meaningful ways? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it cuts out all the noise, you know? It cuts out all the, like, you know, you're not going to go and sit in someone's backyard and social distance and go through all the, when you're not really that into that person. So it cuts your social circle, <laughs> for one, because you're like, you're only going to spend time with people that you really, you know, want to see. The other thing, and this is, goes back to, you know, I just stopped, shot my first stand-up special in six years. And yep. I was about to shoot it when COVID started. I was supposed to go on tour and practice it 10 more times or 20 more times and then shoot it. My agents, my managers, everyone was like, if you want this to happen, we will make this happen, but it's going to be difficult. And I was like, let's make this happen. We found a way to get everyone in the audience tested multiple times before they came. Everyone had to quarantine for five days. Then they had multiple tests. We had we kept everybody safe and we did it outdoor at this place called Liberty League Train Station in New Jersey. You know, it comes out next month on HBO Max or this month or whatever month we're in. And it was an incredible example of putting yourself, like you're in this situation boxed in with COVID. And I was like, no, COVID is not gonna box me in. It's how I feel about cannabis. Cannabis isn't gonna do me. I'm gonna do cannabis. Happy 420, everybody. Don't smoke and drive. You know what I mean? <laughs> nothing's gonna nothing's gonna get over on me. So instead of being stuck in that box, I was like, I'm gonna go to New Jersey, I'm gonna film this, and I'm gonna keep everyone that needs to be safe safe, but I'm going to do it because nobody else was doing it, and people need comedy right now. They need it. I was making out with a guy and he started moaning. I go, what are you Are you okay? He's like, oh, I'm just so into this. I go, I'm not anymore. Hey, talk to me a little bit about empathy, because you've said in some of your work that that was something that you realized you didn't have and that you went through a process, including therapy, of trying to discover a little more empathy. Talk a little bit about that. Well, I would. I was went to my psychiatrist the first time because I Trump was elected and I was out of my tree. I was my anger was like I would go to the Fox. I would go check in at the first class lounge when I would fly somewhere. Then I'd go right over to the Fox News section and just start going off on people. I'd walk in. I'd be like, <laughs> "You racist!" And then I'd run out and I'd walk back and be like, "Do you want your daughter to have rights, you?" <laughs> and then I'd run out and then I'd run back in. I mean, terrorizing, terrorizing the Fox News lounge. And so I had to get my anger under control because I wanted to do this cross country tour and actually talk to conservatives and understand, you know, that I was an elitist, that I was living in a bubble. I had to recognize all of these things and reconcile them. And I was happy to do it. I was like, great, more conflict, let's go. I remember telling my psychiatrist like about my anger, you know, and he wanted to talk about my childhood. I'm like, nope, nothing to see there. And he was like, <laughs> it seems to me that you lack empathy. And I was like, like a Republican? And he said, he said, and he had to, like, he said, no, you have to be thinking about, like, he had to draw the line between the distinction between sympathy and empathy. He said, empathy is actually thinking about what it's like to be someone when they're going through something difficult, to actually be in that person's shoes and thinking about what it's like to be them. And I was like, oh, yeah, I, I don't do that. And I was like, I don't. 
I don't do that ever. And I was like, oh God, yeah. So, you know, he was, te he helped me cultivate empathy. I'm still not where I need to be, you know, uh, obviously because I was at such a deficit for so long, but it's nice to have the reminder and the self-awareness now to know, okay, I need to be empathetic in this situation. When I lose patience with someone, I have to actually, you know, I do an exercise where I put them in their shoes, put myself in their shoes and I, Think about, you know, okay, where's this person coming from? They have a completely different background and history than I do. Don't judge people because they're not doing something the way you would do it. You know, you have to be bigger than that. What, and what is that message? What, what, what do you want to share with people? Uh, basically to wake up and get out of your own and to actually look around the world at people that don't look like you and to start thinking about what it's like to be those people. I'm clearly the beneficiary of white privilege. I want to know how to be a better white person to people of color. Oh. You know, I think everyone's had a big wake up call in the last five years um, with Black Lives Matter. But for me personally, uh, I, it is a time for all of us to get serious about educating ourselves about what we did in this country, how this country was built, the systems of white supremacy that are in place and de dismantling them. And that means that white people have to step up every single time they see an infraction or an injustice. They have to be loud about it. They cannot look by and let things happen. Chelsea, how do you find that you most effectively get through to white people who haven't been tuned into this, who would say, I'm not racist, um, or at least I'm not actively racist, um, but you know, it has, I haven't been thinking about the George Floyds of the world. I haven't been thinking about the more subtle uh, versions of that. What have you found effective? Is it, it, is it comedy? Is there a certain point that all of a sudden becomes an aha moment and you, you notice that it's then that they really start to engage? I had a white friend the other day who we were at a dinner outside at my friend's house and she said she had read the Robin D'Angelo book, White Fragility. And she goes, oh, I just read that. And she goes, and then we had this conference, you know, with all the people that I work with and the people of color all got on and told us how they had felt working in this environment, you know, being so outnumbered by white people and what it's like. And she's like, and it was just, and she starts crying to me and I go, stop, stop, stop. That's what that book is about is to not, is white fragility. Don't cry. And she goes, but I'm telling you. And I go, that's what has to stop too. Don't come to me with that. Now we go into solution mode. Yes, we did terrible things. And now we have to figure out how every single day you're gonna fix them. And by fixing them, you're going to abstain from perpetuating all of the stereotypes that go along with being a black person, being a brown person, being an indigenous person, and stop talking about things, stop gossiping in that way. Stop saying you're overwhelmed, you know? I mean, the fact that black people even haven't killed us all is a miracle, you know what I mean? Be fearless, we can do it! I believe in you, we can do it faster! The Our Home is the training ground for her dreams policy. Ensure carefully. Dream fearlessly. What do you say to someone uh, like your girl, Tommy Lahren? This great country has three types of governors. The bold ones who will do what is right for their states, the ones throwing their weight around in an iron fist pounding power trip, and the dozen or so in the middle, afraid of their own shadow, who won't make a move. We had a healthy conversation and I was asking her about some of the people she admired, and she mentioned some of the people you might expect who've done well at Fox News, like Laura Ingraham and others, but she also mentioned you. I've had a great conversation with Chelsea Handler, so there are folks that are far, far to the left of me that I count as great people. And she mentioned that she had appreciated that even though you guys disagreed, that the way you engaged her, uh, she felt like was respectful and gave her room and gave her, gave her respect. How have, you, how have you gotten to know her and how do you think about her and maybe some of the perspectives she may bring to the table on this question? Um, I haven't gotten to know her very well. I did interview her once for some political fest and we you know, discovered that she was still on her, health, her parents' health care plan at 26 years old, which meant that she was, um, was under Obamacare. <laughs> so that was a fun discovery during that interview <laughs> after she was going off on how bad Obamacare was for the country. I was like, who's your insurer? She's like, oh, I'm on my parents' plan. I'm like, and where did that come from? Okay, so do you have a health care plan or no? 
Well, luckily, I'm 24, so I'm, I am still on my parents. And to, to say, yeah, you can laugh. You can, you can laugh. I pay my parents for it. You can laugh. But, you know, there's a lot of people that those, you know, young Republicans and these blonde, you know, girls that are espousing all this Republican it, you know, I find it to be harmful and I find it to be very opportunistic. You know, they're looking for a slot because, you know, the Republicans need white women to be like, yeah, yeah, this is great. Uh, when in reality, it's not great. So uh, I don't know if that answers your question about Tommy Lauren or not, but, you know, I kind of find her to be one of those girls. They're just this. There's a dearth of of, of re decent Republicans right now and the country's suffering because of that, you know? Uh, so people like her, I really wish would, would have, an, have some sort of awakening and realize that the harm that they're causing by not being as informed as they could be. Were you, were you funny from the get-go? Were you funny as a kid? I don't know. Some people would argue that I'm still not funny. So I mean, I really, I, I was, I, I was loud. That was a good qualifier <laughs> that I can hold on to. I was definitely always outspoken and very much about hearing my opinion, making my opinion heard. <laughs> and so, what are you like in the family setting? Are you, are you now a little more muted and quiet, or are you still, are you still the loud girl? Oh no, I'm a total, <laughs> and I totally am in charge. I'm the youngest, and I'm the oldest. Like I tell everybody, like if I don't, I know I'm totally in charge of my family. I'm in charge of keeping us together. I'm in charge of organizing the trips and I'm in charge of bad behavior. When there's bad behavior, I call it out. I wrote a big letter to my family after our last vacation to the children and to the adults. And I was like, hey, these are the new rules moving forward. Don't finish bottles of Belvedere when you're 16 years old before noon. That's the kind of conversation I had to have with my family. I didn't appreciate what an interesting mixed growing up situation you had. You had like mixed religions. You were in an unusual place. You were interracial dating. Like you had a lot going. You had, you had a lot going on. I had, had a lot of balls happen? in the air. Uh, yeah, I had a lot of balls in the air. Well, my mom. <laughs> I, 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 re I really appreciate that you went there right away. I love that you <laughs> went to say it, a lot of balls in the air. That's outstanding. Wait, so what happened? So, so, but literally, because that is such like a rich mix. Like, how did how did all this come together? So my mom was Mormon, okay? But I didn't know my mom was Mormon because she kept that under wraps because she was German. So she had come over from Germany when she was around 21 and she met my father who is a lot older than her. Well, maybe not a lot, eight years. I guess that's not that much anymore. Anyway, uh, cause time changes. <laughs> but he was eight years older and he was Jewish. So she kind of kept the German and the Mormon under wraps. And he said, listen, I want to raise all my children Jewish. I want them to get bar and bat mitzvah and they're gonna to go to Hebrew school. And she's like, fine, I'm, I'm on board with that. So she would come to temple with us on Friday nights when we would go. She was very present in the Jewish community, like in terms of temple. And then my brother passed away when I was nine years old and they were planning the funeral. And I overheard my dad, our rabbi was at our house. And my dad was talking about the burial for my brother who had passed away. And my mom, and they were mentioned that my mom couldn't be buried in the same cemetery as my brother because my brother was Jewish and my mother was not. And I remember saying like, what do you mean you're not Jewish? Like, as far as I knew, she was Jewish. And my mom, dad was like, she's not, Chelsea, this isn't the time. She's not Jewish, she's Mormon. And I was like, what's Mormon? And then my brother explains what Mormon was. I'm like, oh my God, my brother's dead. And now I find out that I, I might be Mormon. So it was a hot mess situation. I mean, even our family managed to F up funerals. You know what I mean? It was a hot mess family. We did nothing normal. Wait, now, so what would have happened if you hadn't made it as a comedian? Like, literally, what do you think you would have done? What would have happened? Oh, I would have had to marry a billionaire or something. I mean, I would have just had to be like, I don't know what else I could be capable. Probably like psychology. I'm into psychology. I'm into personal stories. I love hearing about people's interpersonal dramas, affairs. I'm very interested in affairs when people talk about that. <laughs> I'm always like, oh, then what happens? You know, like, I'm very salacious. I like all that stuff. First of all, I 
want to say thank you to every single person who showed up for me today and every single person who showed up to me or for, uh, for me. And I never really got a good chance to be serious and say thank you. And I want you to know that I am grateful for this career. Thank you very much. Now, do, you, do you miss that at all? Do you miss Chelsea lately? No, I don't miss, I don't miss things. I have something missing in me. Like everyone always is like, oh, do you miss this boyfriend or do you miss doing your show? And it's like, no, like I don't, I don't, uh, I don't miss being responsible for so many people. I think that was probably the most taxing part was like all the inner drama that happens on a show when you have like hundreds of people working. And that was fun. I mean, I had a great time doing it, but at the end I was like, okay, this is like managing a bunch of high schoolers. Hang on, this is awkward. I really, I remember you breaking through it and I would start to see you pop in places and I would look forward to seeing you and then all of a sudden you had your show. Like, how do you tell the story? What made you break through? I don't know, you know, people see it in such different ways. It's like, no one ever comes in overnight, obviously. Like, you work and you do stand-up and you get gigs. I don't think it's okay for anybody to have a baby. <laughs> Britney Spears, I don't think it's okay to have two babies and then run around town showing off your Hot Pocket to everybody. And you get jobs that may not lead anywhere or development deals, which I had plenty of, that would you know, say they were gonna like, you know, you would build a show around yourself, but it wouldn't get picked up. So a lot of like false starts, but a lot of like indicators that I was doing, you know, what I was supposed to be doing in my life, like breaks kept happening. And then I think, uh, yeah, I mean, Chelsea Lately was my biggest thing, you know, after I did this small show on Oxygen Network called, on the Oxygen Network called um, Girls Behaving Badly, which was really stupid and funny. And it was like a hidden camera show where we would play the dumbest tricks on people. Like, well, one scene I had to like play a pregnant woman, which I loved playing pregnant women because I knew I'm like, I'm never gonna do that. So it's fun to pretend. Okay, I'm the swim instructor. Whoa. And so we did a lot of stuff like that, and that was a really fun show. I mean, I peed in my pants from laughing while we were filming, I think, twice during that show. So that was a good time. Who's really helped you out? Who's not just been a mentor, but maybe an angel? Um, because I feel like everybody who's got what I call a dream fearlessly story has had a couple people along the way that maybe other people don't know, but actually made a big difference in them breaking through. Who've been some of those angels for you? Um, angels. Bob Greenblatt has been kind of an angel. He gave me my first development deal uh, a long time ago, and then he gave me my first sitcom for that was based on one of my books. I didn't want to be in it, but he made me be in it, and I played my sister, the more my Mormon sister, so that was fun. Um, and then he just gave, he bought my HBO special right before he left HBO. He bought it, so he's been a kind of guy, a kind of one of those people. That's always it's always nice to be coming back around to him, you know, and getting to do business with people you really admire who really get you. People probably hit you up for advice all the time. Like, what do you say to the younger version of yourself when they're trying to make it? Like, when they're asking you how to go about it, like, what do you typically say to them? I, w I mean, I think that, you know, when you are a force of nature, which you have to be to be good at whatever you want to do, but especially in this industry, you have to have a really strong point of view and you have to be a force. You have to be a bowling ball, you know what I mean? That is going in one direction and it doesn't matter what gets in your way, that bowling ball is going to push it out of the way. And when you are sincerely focused with something in your life and you see a direction that you want to take, it is very hard to get someone um, to get out of that focus, you know what I mean? So it's really up to you to have your intention be so strong that anyone in the way of you is going to allow you to come through. And I was dead focused on getting, I just felt like I had something to say, you know? I didn't know exactly what. Now I understand why I've been given, you know, a platform and, you know, a following and why people, and now that, that I have something actually really meaningful to say, and I can combine it with humor, which is really the way to get information across, in my opinion, is the most compelling way. And um, I feel like now I get what my voice is for. Now that I'm older, I'm in my, four, I'm 45, 
I'm enjoying like having a better sense of a bigger sense of responsibility with my messaging and and my contribution. You know, I'm not just cashing checks and hosting silly things that I don't give a about. I'm doing sh jobs and projects that are actually that have a message. I like older men. Which brings me to the strong and deep sexual feelings that I have developed for Andrew Cuomo. I want him to flatten my curve, and then I want to flatten his curve, and then I want us to apex together. You know, you joke a lot about uh, being single, um, not having kids, but the few times I feel like I've met you when you came to Aussie Fest. We need to get out establishment people who've been there for years and years and years, and old white men that are running this country are not reflective of what this country looks like. I did your show when you were just starting out on Chelsea Lately. Something about you always felt to me like someone who, I don't know, it felt like there might be a romantic inside of there. It felt like there might be someone who, who would enjoy a family. Am I, am I off? Am I projecting? Carla, are you hitting on me right now? <laughs> I'm not. I'm just, I'm complimenting you. Um, no, I do. I want to be in a relationship for sure, but with the right person, you know? I mean, and I, you know, all my friends are like, you have such a negative attitude about relationships. It's like, no, I really enjoy my own company. I've gotten to a place in life where I'm totally happy, if that's it. If I have to be with myself, I find that hard to believe. There's too many men out there to not have more than, you know, more experiences with love or, you know, romance. But I am a total romantic. I want to be in love. I love being in love. And I would love to be with somebody, but it's got to be an additive at this point. You know what I mean? I'm not trying to have a baby or trying to settle. Like, I've got to meet somebody who's going to blow me away. And yes, they're not going to be perfect, but they're going to have to bring something that I don't have going on. And, 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 and so what have you seen so far? I mean, is, is, is being famous, is, is being funny, is being a force of personality, uh, is any of that played into uh, good, bad, or, or questionable options, or no? It's a pretty much a boner killer to all men, is what I've discovered. Being outspoken and being loud like myself is not, it's a try, 60 to 80 year olds are my sweet spot. Those are the men that really get me <laughs> and like to hang out with me. Men my age are not into my shtick. All right, are you ready for a little rapid fire? Yeah, yeah, yeah. First question. Will you ever run for office? No, I couldn't survive on that salary. <laughs> That's outstanding. Who's your favorite comedian besides yourself? Who do you, who do you laugh at? Who do you really enjoy? Uh, I love Sarah and Amy. Sarah Silverman and Amy Schumer. They're both uh, good friends, and we were, they make me laugh daily. If you were going to be able to have dinner with anybody, alive or dead, Who's at the top of that list? Who would you Who would you love? Who would you look forward to? You wouldn't just do it to check a box, but you actually would look forward to it. I mean, I guess the Obamas, I would look forward to that. Yeah, you know, there's not a lot of people that I would get that excited about because, I, I mean, I would have to think of some scientist or some doctor that I would, or some anti-aging doctor that I would want to talk to about probably. <laughs> that might become before, that might come before the Obamas. Um, Promise me this won't be the last time that you're here. You will come back, yes? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I love it. Chelsea, thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye. Hey, I hope you laughed as much as I did. I have loved Chelsea Handler for a long time. She's all kinds of inappropriate, all kinds of hilarious, and now she's more profound than ever before. I mean, I love the way she talked about privilege, about empathy, about talking to other people about different topics, um, about making progress, sometimes quietly, sometimes loudly. Really appreciated all of that. Um, can't wait to see what comes next for her. I do think I'm right. I think there's a little uh, bit of good romantic news uh, down the pike. Let's see. Uh, in any case, I hope you really enjoyed the show. And if you did, don't forget you can subscribe, you can tell a friend, but enjoy this podcast. Podcast is really good. It's got the full unfiltered conversation. Give it a try. I'll see you soon. Hey, tune into the Carlos Watson Show. It's like no other. You're going to enjoy it every weekday on YouTube.